We're all the South, the 18th and last by-election of this Parliament. The Conservatives have lost all by-election seats during this Parliament and it looks as though this will be no exception. The by-election caused by the death of Barry Porter, who had a majority of over 8,000 at the last election. And it's low on Labour's targets, it's over 100 in Labour's list of target seats. The count going on there and uh, the result expected round about one o'clock, we think. In a moment, we'll get the turnout figures there. It appears to have been a, a very high turnout for a by-election. In fact, probably the second highest of this parliament. And good morning, and welcome to this by-election special, the last by-election special of this parliament, too. Uh, we'll be getting the result. We'll be talking about the consequences in the final days of this parliament, with only a few weeks now to go until the general election itself and to guide us through from the point of view of their political parties, Stephen Dorrell, the Secretary of State for Health for the Conservatives, the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, John Prescott, and Mingis Campbell for the Liberal Democrats. And of course to analyse the figures, Peter Snow. And the swing, of course, is a thing that will decide it all at the next general election, and we'll be watching very carefully to see what happens in Wirral South for some kind of guide as to what will happen to these vulnerable blue conservative seats here, vulnerable to each point of swing to Labour. Now, what Mr Blair needs for an overall majority is to turn just 55 or so of these blue seats red to achieve an overall majority of just one. Now, if he wins Wirral South tonight, he will have achieved a swing of at least 8.5%. That's Wirral South there, that small red figure there representing a Labour gain, if that's what it is, in Wirral South. A swing of 8.5%. Now that, if reflected as a general election all over the country, would see a very comfortable Labour majority indeed of just under 100. But of course, anything could happen. It could be more than that, it could be less than that. And how, anyway, can one single by-election guide us about the result of a general election? We'll be examining all that in this programme. And backing up what uh, Peter Snow uh, has to say with me here, the BBC's political editor, Robin Oakley, and Professor Anthony King of Essex University to cast a few pearls of wisdom before us. And we go now up to join John Sopel, who's our reporter at the count in Wirral South. John, tell us about turnout, first of all. The turnout is very high, David. It's 73%. That is the second highest in this parliament. The only one that exceeded that was in Christchurch, which the Liberals took a couple of years back. And apparently, since 1979, I think, there have only been six by-elections where the turnout has been over 70%. The significance of that, of course, is that I think... And I think we're going to get the candidate arriving now. Here's Liz Chapman. He's just walking into the hall, mobbed by the media. A rather low-profile figure during the by-election campaign. Labour minders ushering him in. And he's waving as if he's uh, won already. But in fact, they haven't actually started counting yet. They're still verifying the ballot papers. But former diplomat, small businessman, the quintessential uh, new Labour candidate, uh, only a ma member of the Labour Party for eight months, now going back into the hall. Let's just go back to what we were talking about turnout. The significance of that is, of course, that the Tories had, I think, been hoping to say, low turnout, our supporters had stayed at home, it'll be very different in a general election. Well, that hasn't clearly happened this time. Well, you're standing in front of a sign that says Euro Wirral. Um, yes. I, I thought you were in Wirral South. What on earth is Euro Wirral? It sounds, think, like a, it sounds like a railway train. Yes, I think Euro Wirral is a sign, a symbol perhaps, of the fact that Merseyside gets quite a lot of money uh, from the European Union. I think it's probably to do with something called Objective 2 status. Uh, and so therefore, I think that the, the sign of the European flag there uh, next to Wirral is probably um, the reason for that particular symbol. Uh, but uh, David Hunt, one of the most pro-European members of the Conservative Party, party, is around here. And I'll ask him later on what this Okay, and John, about. one other thing any clues why there should be such a high turnout with the general election so close well it, it, it's fascinating isn't it because we we're so used to talking about the disillusionment in British politics and here they are the people of Wirral are electing an MP for barely a month and the turnout has been 73 percent it's also a very new register so what tends to happen if it's a very old register a number of people who have died a number of people will have moved out of the area and that would explain a low turnout Everyone who's on this register has only recently gone on it, and therefore that possibly explains it. But perhaps it's a sign that people do see this as Act 1 of the general election campaign, and not something that's completely different from it. Thanks, John. We'll be back with you later on. Peter Snow, could we just have a look now in more detail at the constituency and what we should be looking for tonight? Right. Well, the rules out will not only be the last by-election of this parliament, it will also be the by-election to decide for the rest of this parliament, whether it be days or weeks, 
just who will have a majority in the House of Commons. Let's open the doors of the House of Commons for a moment and look at the scorecard. Uh, here we have the opposition on the right-hand side here, the government on the left, and as you can see, it's an absolute tie. There we have Labour and its allies, some of them allies, on the, on the right-hand side of the House here, and there's the government there, 322 to 322, no overall majority. So Will South, whichever way it goes, will decide who has the majority of the votes in the House of Commons, who add up all the opposition parties together. Now, Will South, a very comfortable Conservative seat, there's Port Sunlight there, and the other side you've got Hesvoy, it's normally a seat you'd expect the Tories to win, there it is in the middle of the Wirral Peninsula there between the Mersey and the Dee, and the score last time was a massive 25,000 odd votes for the Tory, way ahead of Labour with the Lib Dems down there in a rather poor third place, a majority of 8,100 for the Tories, a pile of votes and when you look at the share of the vote, the pile of votes for the Tories, 16% ahead of Labour, with the Liberal Democrats uh, on 13%. Now, that was the position at the last general election. There we have 51, 35 and 10. Look what's happened in the campaign. If we believe that anything the polls are saying at all, it is a huge turnaround. There it is, changing places, 52% Labour in the first poll, Mori poll in the Sun on 20th of January, a whole 16% uh, ahead of the Tories in second place, with the Liberal Democrats down there in third place. And that's the way, really, it stayed right the way through the campaign. With on the, in the mail on Sunday, on 9th of February, Morris suggesting 54, 35, 10, a 19% lead opening up a bit, and staying much the same, again, a 19% lead there uh, in the Liverpool Echo, 17th of February, just 10 days ago, suggesting, really, that it's just a gap was opened up there, which uh, is not going to close. Anyways, the polls are suggesting, and if the polls are right, it's something like a 17% swing, a disastrous swing against the Tories, only a couple of months at the most before a general election, if that is what happens. David. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Stephen Dorrell, one of your lines of defence, uh, if you lose tonight, as it looks as though you will do, uh, might have been that it was a very low turnout, and therefore not too much should be... Um, deduced from it. 73% turnout must be rather a shock for you, isn't it? Well, I don't think it should be a shock to anybody. I'm in favour of participation in elections and I'm pleased that uh, people have participated in it. But I think the overwhelming uh, weight of the evidence that we received from my colleagues who've been up to Wirral, indeed my own experience when I went there, was that repeatedly we were told uh, that we're fed up with the government, we're going to kick the government, but don't worry, we'll be back when the general election comes. They regard this as a, an opportunity for a demo uh, rather than the choice of a government. But and you they, said it was certain you were going to win at the beginning of this I was uh, there fighting a by-election. Uh, no, I was lying to, because I, you were fighting a by-election. I wanted to win. Uh, I am quite clear that many of the people who withheld their support uh, in the election today are committed in their own minds to voting for the Tory candidate in the general election. But they're very keen indeed, if what you say is right, to kick the government. You can't be that confident that in five weeks, six, ten weeks' time, they'll turncoat. I simply repeat to you what they've said, not just to me, but to uh, all of my colleagues who've come back and repeated the same experience. They've said, you're unpopular, we don't like everything you've done, we're going to punish you, we're going to kick you, was I think Michael Heseltine's uh, accurate phrase. And, uh, but we'll be back when the general election comes, because at the general election, they'll be deciding the shape of the government, and uh, Labour commit themselves to a budget six, uh, within 10 weeks of polling day. They won't tell us what's in it. Now, I think that if somebody commits themselves to a budget but won't tell you what's in it, it's likely you won't like when it. When was the last Chancellor of the Exchequer who said what was in his budget before he announced it? Well, you don't normally, if you go into an election, refuse to tell the people what you intend to do ten weeks after polling day. John Prescott, does that analysis of the Tory voters' position stand up for you? No, but I think the first point to make about the high poll is that uh, new registers, if you look at the 13 by-elections since 1979, and half of them have been over 70%. It does encourage a high turnout, but anybody who's been taking any part in this by-election knows there's a great enthusiasm to turn out, certainly amongst many Tory voters. Now, whether they're going to give them the kick in that Hesseltine feared they were going to do, which reflected those polls, I suspect they are. But I think no by-election has been as near to the general election as this one, within weeks of the general election, and therefore it will be very interesting to see what the swing is. I believe Labour's going to get well over 50% of it. We're going to do well in this poll, and we're going to switch the positions around. The Tories are going to fall to such an extent that I don't think it will be just simply seen as a protest in the general election. All the evidence we're getting uh, is that they will stay with the candidate, who is the MP, Ben Chapman. He will be the one that will be supporting the general election. Were you entirely happy with the hoops that Labour was prepared to put itself through to try and win the Wirral? I mean, having a candidate who only just joined the party, 
um, halfway or just at the beginning of the campaign saying that grammar schools, which Labour for years well, and years want to get rid of, what weren't going to be abolished well, and weren't well, under first of threat. All, I mean, was that all well, first pleasing of all, to you? Well, first of all, we chose a candidate, it was a local candidate, we thought we were the best for the area. It seems that we were right about that. In regard, of educa in regard to education, we fought on all issues, but particularly education as well, because the government only wanted to make that one issue. Uh, Stephen Doddle came up, he's the health minister, I understand it, all he could talk about was education. Howard came up, he's the crime man, couldn't talk about crime, only about education. And we met that argument head on, talked about the issues of the grammar schools and also public education But suddenly well. the grammar schools were safe because of the world. Well, election. I think David uh, Blunkett's statement about giving the parents the rights to say whether they wish to retain the uh, grammar schools was something that was developed nearly 18 months ago, certainly when the will wasn't considered to be... Hang the, on a minute, uh, John. 18 months ago... David Bunkett was in your party conference saying, watch my lips, no selection. Yes, but he also said the development of the grammar schools that we exist in, 161, I mean, you closed down 400 of them, so we were left with 161, and we said we would develop and allow the parents to have their say in whether they retained the grammar schools. And we made that case all the way through this election, all the time. And it, I think we'll begin to see in this result that the electorate understood that and accepted it. But Labour, old Labour, has had to swallow an awful lot. Well, it is a Labour Party that changed quite considerably. That's true, and I think the electorate have identified that. They see Tony Blair as a force for change in British politics, and one that they find a positive force for change. And there have been changes in the Labour Party that's been emphasised being, by being using the term New Labour, but I think the electorate like it, and I think this result will be a historic one in that sense for the New Labour, and present a new party that has gone through change, knows how to do chair, do deal with change, is united and contrasts with the bitterly divided Tory government. Mings Campbell, how do you read this, this result and, well, I don't and, think it's and the, be, way, the way Labour particularly has been positioning itself? Well, I don't think it's going to be a historic result for the Liberal Democrats because we've got 13% in the general election. If these opinion polls uh, are borne out in the actual result, then we'll have done rather well because we'll have maintained that percentage in the face of what might be the circumstances of the classic two-party squeeze. If you remember, for example, in Christchurch and in Newbury, we squeezed the Labour Party down to rather less than 2% in each case. There's no doubt that Labour has set out to present uh, not so much new Labour as the newest Labour, because, of course, uh, the candidate joined the party less than 12 months ago. He's been kept away. They've had no press conferences. I understand there was a, a meeting arranged last night in the constituency, and Labour sent along Michael Meacher rather than their candidate, whereupon the Tory candidate withdrew, and only our candidate, the Liberal Democrat, Flo Plukas, was willing to go ahead of the meeting. So this hasn't been uh, a typical by-election campaign. This has been a campaign in which the Labour Party has kept its candidate away from the kind of searching questions, examples of which you've just given us in your, but, uh, your conversation with John Do you admire the canniness with which Labour has fought for the seat in Wirral South then? Well, I think what they, if they win, they'll say that uh, the end justified the means. But I think it's quite difficult for them to say uh, that this is an indication of an overall change in the way the people of the United Kingdom are thinking when they have treated their candidate in such a kid glove way. Can All right, but let's... the civil servant only a few months? I mean, there is a kind of rule on high-level civil servants, and he was certainly one of them, about belonging to political parties. Some do, some don't, but there's a general feeling they're not supposed to be in that impartiality. And so when they come out and they retire, they join the Labour Party. Now, that seems to be quite acceptable. It's a rule generally accepted by civil servants and not something that's unique. I okay. think that, uh, Let's, the, the uh, Labour candidate, I agree with John, actually, I think it's perfectly reasonable for people to come out of civil service and join the party. The interesting thing about the Labour candidate is that he doesn't appear to agree with his own party's policy. He's been widely reported as distancing himself from exactly this, this uh, issue of um, selective schools. Uh, that we were just talking well, about, making it clear that he wasn't let's persuaded go in, by let's his go into that a bit later on. Yeah. Let's, let's go you into said we were going to win the by-election, but should I believe on, that? Let's move on and have a look at the at by-elections and this by-election in particular, Peter. Only once since the war has a governing party got into a last-minute by-election and improved its position. That was the Hull North by-election in 1966. Harold Wilson went into it, not quite knowing what happened, coming out with an increased Labour vote, saying, all right, I'll call the general election straight away and coming back with a thumping great Labour majority. That was a, a moment when the Labour Party won the by-election very well and went on to win the general election. Most governments tend to expect, as Mr Heseltine does, a kicking in a final last-minute by-election. Now, here's Mr Major's battle bus on its way to the general election. What sort of last-minute by-election drop in the Conservative vote can we expect? The final plunge. Now, imagine in front of the battle bus a trough into which uh, governments tend to sink as they take their last by-election plunge and then 
come up, or don't come up, as the case may be, to go through the winning post and win the election. Now, let's just look at what's happened in past times. First of all, 1992, three by-elections, and Mr. Major had to go through uh, on the same day, just before the general election in 1992. Well, he dropped, all right, the battle bus went on, and it dropped down, but it made it up to the winning post, it recovered, it had the momentum to gain height again and go through and win the election. The drop was only 6.5%, so the Conservative vote was down 6.5% in those three by-elections, on average. Then we had Mrs. Thatcher at Truro in 1987, the Liberal Democrats won the by-election, on went her battle bus, down into the valley, up the other side, bit of a tough strain getting up there, but she made it though, minus 7% uh, the uh, drop in 1987. 1983, the Darlington by-election, down she went again, there's her battle bus, into the gully, up the other side, quite a pull down and pull up, minus 8.5%. So they all made it. And look at the size of the drop in the by-elections that they suffered. Now, some weren't so lucky. Here's Sir Harold Wilson in Ayrshire South in 1970. There's the Labour battle bus. Off it goes. Let's see what happens to it. Down it goes. It gets stuck in the mire up to its axles. A minus 13% drop in the Labour government vote uh, in 1970, just before the June election, which uh, Harold Wilson failed to pull out of and he lost. There's the Tories. There's Ted Heath in 1974 just before the 1974 by, uh, general election, four by-elections in 73, the end of 73, the average drop in the Conservative vote, watch for it, down he goes, and the average drop in that vote there was minus 16%. No way it was going to get out of the mire and up through the winning post and win the election. Simply didn't have the momentum. And here's Jim Callaghan, the worst of all uh, failures in 1979. Poor old Jim Callaghan's battle bus went over the top, down into the mire, right down, almost covering the entire bus, minus 28%, uh, and that meant that he, too, didn't make the general election. Now, we can draw a line along here, then, between the winners and the losers. There, that dotted line represents roughly the point below which it is really rather unhappy to go. If you achieve a drop of less than 10%, history suggests, these by-elections anyway, suggests if you achieve a drop of less than 10%, then there's a chance of getting through the winning place. If, however, you go down to that trough and suffer a drop of more than 10%, anything like this, then your chances of making it through the winning post look pretty grim. So if that's any guide, if history's any guide, and of course it's very cautious about that, then Mr. Major doesn't want to go down more than 10%. David. Peter, thank you very much. Now, the other Peter, Peter Kellner, is a sophologist up at the constituency tonight, and we join him there. He's in the foyer of the, uh, of the count. Peter, what can you tell us about the outcome as it looks as though it'll be at this stage. Well, Les Barham, the Conservative candidate, just arrived uh, just a few moments ago, and the news he's receiving from his people is that he has lost, and that he's lost quite heavily. Now, the, the people have been watching, the professionals from the party have been watching the ballot papers unfold. They've been putting their heads together, one or two getting their little pocket computers out. And the consensus seems to be we're looking for a Labour majority of around six, seven, eight thousand, something like 22, 23,000 for Ben Chapman, the Labour candidate, 15, 16,000 uh, for the Conservatives, with the uh, Liberals down at um, three, three, three and a half thousand, something like that. Now, what this means is that the Conservatives have lost 10,000 votes since the last election. Perhaps more important is that Labour's vote in absolute numbers has gone up by 5,000. It's not a question of Tories staying at home. It isn't even just a question of the Liberal Democrats being squeezed to Labour loops. Undoubtedly, some of them have. Labour has taken votes directly and in significant numbers from the Conservatives. Uh, Peter, um, you've probably heard Peter Snow saying that uh, a drop of more than 10% in the Conservative vote at this stage of a Parliament historically has spelt trouble. Uh, what is the drop in percentage terms in the Conservative vote, well, if well, your if, figures are correct? If the estimates are right, we're looking at a drop of around 15, 16 points. It's something like Labour 52%, Conservatives 35%. Now, these are estimates based on people watching the ballot papers come out of the boxes. They may be a point or two out either way, but that's the order of magnitude. It's certainly a greater loss of Tory share than that 10% line that Peter Snow is showing. Uh, and, and what do you think this is attributable to? Well, I mean, I you, you, Stephen Dorrell was saying, you know, the, the Tories have been telling the Tories that this is a kick in the teeth because of uh, being discontented with the government, but they're going to go back and vote for them in, in uh, a few weeks' time. Well, different people say different things, the canvassers and so on on the doorstep. I spent the day going round a large number of the polling stations here in the constituency. Well, I've been asking people if they came out of the polling stations how they voted this time, how they voted last time. 
and I found a significant number, about a quarter of the people who said they voted Conservative last time, were switching almost entirely, not completely, but almost entirely to Labour. And they went on to say, well, why have you switched and uh, are you going to go back? And two things emerged. Firstly, that almost entirely they said they wanted to get the government out. It wasn't a positive statement of enthusiasm for Labour. They were determined to get the Conservatives out. But secondly, they saw this as a sort of general election part one. I personally found no evidence that this was a, a short-term protest vote that they go back in a couple of months to the government. Now, you know, it was only a straw poll going around the constituency, but for what it's worth, my evidence is that these people have been changed. Often from a lifetime of Conservative support to go to Labour, I think most of them are likely to stay Labour. Stephen Dora, what's your reaction to that, that uh, people were telling Peter Kellner that they wanted to get the government out? I mean, it does, on the whole, with only a few weeks to go to a general election, seem rather odd to say they're just kicking you in the teeth and then they're going to have you back? Well, I accept that it's uh, not, an, not an easy uh, voter reaction to explain, but I simply recount what happened to me and what my colleagues say happened to them. Uh, they were Peter, being, Peter being, said, being polite to you? Well, no, I don't think they'd, if they're telling you that, that they're going to vote against you, they don't have to go on to say that we'll be back by the, the general election. But if they volunteer that information, it seems to me there's some significance in the fact that they do so. Tony King, how do you read this? Do you think there's, there's, there's encouragement for the Tories in what Stephen Dorrell reports? No, I don't. Uh, quite apart from the straw poll that Peter Kellner reported, it's also the case that some of the polls up there have been asking people how they would vote in a general election. And polls in the past have often found quite a sharp discrepancy between what people said they were going to do either in a local election or a by-election on the one hand and at a general election on the other. They weren't finding that in the Wirral. I would be surprised if there weren't some swing back to the Conservatives in that constituency before polling day. But my guess is that Peter Kellner is right, that the people of the Wirral have made up their minds what they want and what they don't want is a Conservative government in for another term. And is a 73% turnout ominous? for the Tories? Uh, it does suggest a degree of enthusiasm for the task of outing the government that uh, one might not have anticipated. Robin Oakley, what's your view about what's going on in the Wirral and what effect it's going to have if it's uh, true that uh, the, the defeat is on the scale that we've heard? Well, I think the Conservatives are going to have to think about their whole election strategy because they've been faced by this great problem of people saying it is time for a change. That is the refrain that I got on the doorstep constantly in Wirral. Time after time, people were saying, oh, well, it really is time for a change. We've had this lot in for 17, 18 years. We've really got to try something different. Uh, and how do you counter the argument of time for a change? The government seems to have decided to counter it by attempting to raise fears about what the change would be to. They talk of constitutional upheaval or Labour perhaps being soft in Europe, uh, that kind of thing but they haven't really been able to get that fear factor going. Certainly not in a by-election where people are only electing an MP for perhaps five weeks. You can't be very frightened of somebody you're just going to elect uh, for five weeks. But it does seem the whole fear factor approach from the Tories has been very little positive about their campaign. Prime Minister's given some of these press conferences, talked about things like workers' shares or educational standards, but that doesn't seem to have been the kind of theme that the Tories have picked up and run with in the way that Labour have with their simple little five-point card that uh, John Prescott had some trouble finding in his pocket at the last Labour Party conference. I've got but it here. I just want to get this clear. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, A it positive has, campaign. Well, it has given you something yeah. uh, definite to fasten on to and, and to sell on the doorsteps. And I think the Tory party campaign has been so built on, on negative campaigning, fear of what a Labour government might bring, and that hasn't really worked. And what the about the issue of the economy? And uh, Kenneth Clark on and on and on saying the best this, the best that. Is that not going to work over the next few, well, few weeks? Well, there's, there's a lot of evidence of, of better economic statistics. The feel-good factor is there um, in some of the polling evidence that we're seeing now, but the government aren't being given any thanks for people feeling better about the economy. People are tending to blame the government for what goes wrong and for what they see as having gone right in their own lives economically. They're saying, well, that's down to them themselves rather than to the government. John Sopel, uh, up there at the count. Any news now on, on when we can get the result? Well, I think, David, it's going to be another 40 minutes or so before the result's declared. The problem is the ballot papers, they've got so many candidates that they're quite unwieldy, literally, to deal with. And what happens is they've got to unfold them all before they can start counting. And I think that's what's put us back a bit 
on the timing of it. Uh, they're, st they're making strong progress now, so uh, they're still saying gone one o'clock, you know, 1.30ish before we'll get the result. Obviously that gets tricky if anyone's in the danger of lost deposit territory. Uh, the Liberal Democrats are saying that they're not in that position yet, but I think their vote is being squeezed very heavily by the Labour Party, who look cock-a-hoop. They, they, they think the votes are piling up in their thousands for Labour, and quite a majority it looks like they will get at the end of the day. Well, let's pray we don't have a, a recount, or several recounts, because of a lost deposit, whoever it's for. Um, because we'll be here forever. But um, let's now have a look, though, at the campaign itself in Wirral South. Now that the voting is over, we can speak frankly and fearlessly, and Michael Crick has this report. In Port Sunlight last night, a scene that not so long ago would have been unthinkable. One of our great political parties wrapping itself shamelessly in the Union flag. All it lacked for a true conservative occasion were the strains of land of hope and glory. Only this was the British Labour Party, scenting that their man, Ben Chapman, was on the eve of a historic victory. We ask tomorrow the people of the world to vote Labour not as a protest, but for a change of government. Equally unusual was that this was the only rally any of the three main parties have held here, whereas by-election candidates often used to address several public meetings a night. We also missed that other by-election ritual, the daily morning press conference, where unfortunate candidates were traditionally grilled and sometimes skewered by the gentlefolk of the media. This has been a strange by-election campaign, and given its proximity to a general election, it's been surprisingly lacking in political drama. Deprived of many of the traditional features of a by-election, it's been difficult to get any sense of an evolving story week by week. It's been hard for the candidates to bat the issues back and forwards between each other. And there's been remarkably little interaction between events on the national political stage and what's been going on here in Wirral South. The one real local issue was whether or not Labour wanted to close Wirral's grammar schools. But when the Education Minister turned up unannounced at a grammar school being visited that day by the Shadow Education Secretary David Blunkett, it produced the ultimate public relations disaster. A government minister, along with his candidate, being expelled from school. I'm the senior governor at this school. And my understanding is that you have no authority to be here and conduct this interview. That's my understanding. I don't know what you said, but I think you should leave the premises until you're invited. We'd really very much like the shadow spokesman to, to, to go head to head with the minister here, if, if we'd like. The governor, it should be said, was a Labour nominee, and the local education authority, Labour controlled. I think it's an opportunity to clarify exactly what it is that the Labour Party are going to do about grammar schools. And grammar schools are a very important part of, of, of the world and of the locality. And the Tories wouldn't let the issue drop. With the Education Secretary, Gillian Shepherd, visiting three schools one day, the Home Secretary back in the classroom the next. So Howard, why are you uh, visiting a school when uh, Mrs Shepherd visited three of them yesterday? Shouldn't you be visiting a police station? <laughs> well, I, I visit very many police stations, but uh, I mean, education is of particular interest to the voters in this constituency. But Labour partly defused the grammar school issue by reassuring voters no such school would close without parental consent. The issue never ignited enough to endanger the party's persistent lead in the local polls. As for the Liberal Democrats, their prospects in Wirral South might have been especially promising, given the party's historic strength just across the water in Liverpool. And only a few years ago, one easily could have envisaged this as a location where the Lib Dem campaign would suddenly have taken off and delivered one of their famous by-election triumphs. Remember how in Bermondsey in 1983 and Greenwich in 1987, the Centre Party administered a fatal blow to Labour's national chances just before a general election. But now the climate is vastly different. And this was a rush job in. 
For Paddy Ashdown and his party, it didn't help that Flo Klukas was a bit of a rush job after the two previous candidates they picked had to step down. This was always going to be a defensive operation for the Lib Dems, trying to ensure their vote wasn't squeezed by the big two. And they never devoted the kind of money or manpower one sees in a by-election they think they can win. The feisty Mrs. Klukas seemed more suited to the rough street fighting of Liverpool politics than to the more genteel style of the Wirral. Here, Ben Chapman had just the right image to appeal to disaffected Tories, the kind of grey and offensive figure one might avoid at a conference of the CBI. The fact that Mr Chapman has been a Labour member for less than a year probably bolstered his appeal among what party strategists call switchers, ex-conservatives who are now committed to Labour. He might be very new to politics, but Mr Chapman has quickly picked up the script now, word for word. Tough on crime and we're going to be tough on the causes of crime, but the first thing we're going to do is get young offenders into, into a, a, a trial situation quicker than they are at the present time. And, uh, and it was entirely appropriate that he should have been backed by the most prominent switcher of all, the former Tory MP, Alan Howard. How are your own efforts to, to find yourself a seat, Mr Howard? At the moment I don't have a seat, and at the moment I'm very happy to concentrate on supporting Ben Chapman in his campaign to win South Wirral for Labour. Perhaps you should have given up your seat for Mr, Mr. Howard. <laughs> well, is it true that uh, Tony Blair promised to get you one if he could? Certainly not. So there's, no, there's not been a deal done. That at that moment, one of Ben Chapman's protectors whisked him away. The Labour candidate, who was once a civil servant, is now a businessman. But perhaps the most brazen aspect of his campaign has been his slogan, Ben Chapman means business. Not so long ago, that would have sparked an internal party revolt. But one can easily see Tony Blair's boys now modifying it to Labour means business for the national hostilities that lie ahead. But in planning their general election itinerary, Labour's apparatchiks will have to take care in picking their locations. When Mr Blair visited the candy fridge factory, the management seemed rather cool, if not frosty, about his economic policies. Are you the boss of this company? Are you the boss? No, the company. One of them. You think uh, the Labour government would be good for candies? We'll, uh, can we talk later? Why can't you answer the question now? But later never came, for when I approached him afterwards, the candy man was even less forthcoming. As ever in a by-election, serious politics often descended to absurdity. Yeah, Where are they? Where's the pastries? I don't want to test your custards. I, one of my tests I always do. Eh? When John Prescott visited a supermarket, he made a beeline for the custard tarts. Now, let's have a test of these. Well, what's the point you're trying to make here, Mr. Prescott? I just love chips. <laughs> <laughs> so tell them about that. No, can't. Just a politician who likes a custard. And what's Labour's policy on custard? <laughs> Bigger and better. <laughs> and no tax on them. So, Mr Blair, no need to worry about promising him the Deputy Prime Ministership. Minister for Custards will be enough. But somewhere lurked a serious point. Labour's claim, which we can expect ad nauseam this spring, that the Tories will put VAT on food something the Conservatives themselves strenuously deny. Great. Thanks very much. Then there was the ludicrous tale of Heswall Fire Station. Tony Blair came to town and twice signed a petition against plans to cut Manning at the station. Lo and behold, the following week, Glenda Jackson dramatically turned up and announced Labour had saved the fire station. But Mr Blair's powers seemed rather less than miraculous once people realised it was Labour councillors who'd been suggesting the cuts in the first place. With voters, candidates found that the economy was seldom mentioned, in contrast to the way it dominated by elections earlier this Parliament. That should have helped the Tories. But instead, people raised the usual range of other concerns. Crime, health, education and Europe. We you may lose out thing. initially if we leave Europe, yeah. but I'm sure if we carry on the way we're doing, 
we could, but I think if, if Labour could, get in, we as could you leave know, Europe behind. Uh, we'll be deeper and further in. We'll be stuffed so far into I'll Europe, right. you won't see our legs hanging out. I've got two children at school, one in reception at the moment, mm -hmm. but I believe I'll have to start getting those shoe vouchers from. We're going to abolish that and, right. and instead substitute um, uh, nursery schools for four year olds throughout. Right. So all that bureaucracy that you have with the vouchers won't be there. Right. Well, I actually work down at St. Catherine, so I actually know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and there is a proposal to actually shut two wards, mm. give us one at Clatterbridge, mm. and then buy, perhaps buy in services from nursing homes. That's good. But you are, no, you are still losing DME beds on the wall. Liz Byram, a chartered surveyor, was good on his feet and remained cheerful. But his campaign was handicapped from the start when Michael Heseltine appeared to throw in the towel by admitting people would use the contest as an opportunity to kick the government. Nor did it help when Brian Mawinney came up to the Wirral and refused to scotch the idea that if things look really bad for the Tories, then the by-election might be scrapped in favour of a general election. Can you guarantee there will be a by-election on the 27th of February? Well, that's what my plan is, and that's why I'm here, that's why cabinet ministers are here, and that's why cabinet ministers will be here again next week. Can you assure us it will happen on the 27th? I've just answered the question. No, you haven't. Yeah, but yes, I have. You said that's your plan. That's right. It is my plan. But locally, conservative efforts seemed increasingly confined to defending the prosperous Heswall part of the seat, and they obviously lack manpower and Labour's slick organisation. This house meeting, for instance, seemed utterly pointless. The handful of voters present were all party activists, and even the dog appeared less than impressed with hearing the roads minister, John Watts. After another unfavourable poll last week, Mr Byram seemed to fear his cause was lost. Even he must have noticed how few homes sported his posters. Why are nearly all your posters in farmers' fields rather than people's homes? That's not true, of course. You've obviously not been round for it. For national reasons, the Tories could never give up. This contest probably saw more visits by cabinet ministers than any by-election in history. On one occasion, three together. And several big ministers came twice. But all along, the real question was not who would win here, but the size of the inevitable swing to Labour and the consequent effect on each party's national momentum and morale. A handsome Labour majority might make Tony Blair look unstoppable. But if Labour's advance has been contained here, even to a small margin of victory, it would give the Tories faint fragments of hope. Michael Crick there. Well, now let's go back up to the constituency of Wirral South and join John Sopel, who has with him two MPs whose job was to look after their two candidates. John. Thank you, David. I'm joined by the former Cabinet Minister, David Hunt, who's from the neighbouring constituency of Wirral West, and Ian McCartney, who was Ben Chapman's minder, his muscles, I think, during uh, the campaign. Uh, da David Hunt, it, you, as my Crick's film showed, you've thrown everything into this campaign. I'm not wishing to be too dramatic about it, but you're going down in flames, aren't you? No, well, we've been fighting to win. That's why we've thrown everything in. But can I just point out, I'm not uh, Les Byram's minder. Uh, he's a first-class candidate. He hasn't needed a minder. But there's no doubt that a lot of people voting in this by-election would know that John Major would still be Prime Minister the day after they voted. But you are so going down still, big time, aren't you? Well, there is still the by-election syndrome. Now, the last by-election in Staffordshire would mean here a Labour majority of over 12,000. We will have to see when the votes are counted that, exactly you, what the effect has been. But that you could legitimately say, well, that was mid-term. I mean, compare this to Langbar at the last general election, six months out from the last general election, swing to Labour of 3.6%. It's going to be much bigger than that tonight. No, but John, it wasn't mid-term. That's the last by election I'm talking about, where I was in Staffordshire not very long ago, fighting away. But don't forget, there has developed a huge floating vote and a by-election syndrome in this country. A lot of people on the doorstep today saying to me, well, don't worry, Mr Hunt, because I used to be their MP until boundary changes. Don't worry, Mr Hunt, we'll still vote for your party at the general election, but, you know, they wanted to deliver a protest vote. Ian, and this is their last chance. Ian McCartney, is that what they were saying to you on the doorstep? No, people are sick and tired. They've had enough of this government. And what they were saying for the first time ever, they were going to come across to New Labour, like to our policies, we're being positive. The Tories have fought an absolute negative campaign. We didn't talk about their own policies, always talking about Labour. 
and they tried to even talk down the results and what we've seen today is a resounding result for Labour. Haven't you put your finger on it Mr McCartney because you said that they're sick and tired of the Tories. No great enthusiasm for Tony Blair, no great enthusiasm for Tony Blair's policies. What they're saying is they wanted to kick the government as David Hunt was saying. No, no, this result proves the absolute opposite. They've come out in droves, this is one of the highest turnouts in a by-election in the last 20 years and they've come out because they like Ben Chapman is a strong voice for the world, and they like Tony Blair. They see Tony Blair as a, someone, unlike John Major, uh, in charge of his party, uh, a government in drift. They want some leadership, they want new policies, a new programme, and this by-election is part of that process of getting a general election of Labour government. David Hunt, doesn't it trivialise the depth of your problem for you to simply say, well, these people are voting in a by-election, they want to kick the government now, they'll all come back to the Conservative Party come the general election in a few weeks' time? Yeah, but don't forget, I'm telling you what they actually said to me on the doorstep today. And yeah. Ian's point, I don't think, is valid. Tony Blair, though, has been saying just what John Major's been saying. And the big problem come the general election is going to be that all three party leaders are going to say the same thing. The key question is which one of them really means it. But, and, but and the only one who's really believed it all his political life is John Major. But why so close to an election are the people turning away from the Conservative Party in droves? Well, let's wait to see exactly what the result is. But I, I haven't had hostility on the doorstep. In previous by-elections, I've come across real hostility. There is a feeling that the country is doing well at the moment, best economic figures for a generation. And let's wait and see when the general election comes, people will be voting for a government. In this by-election, they know the government will be the same the day after. A very quick final question, Mr Hunt. We see the sign Euro, we're all behind us. David Dimbleby was asking me earlier what it <laughs> meant. A uh, pro-European MP like yourself, can you shed light on it? Yes, it means that we're all is right at the heart of Europe and we are very positive about Europe and it means of course lots of jobs, lots of help, lots of activity in Wirral. But not many directly for the related. Conservative Party. Well, no, <laughs> don't forget it was the Conservative Party who took Wirral into Europe. It was the Conservative Prime Minister who signed all the key treaties. We are the party of You're Europe right. and Wirral is Euro Wirral. <laughs> uh, this is one of the safest Tory seats in England going Labour tonight. There's a massive re resounding defeat for the government, a rejection of John Major and his cabinet. And what people are now looking for is a general election, a new Labour government. No, Thank I don't you. agree with that. I think we I have think to, to learn the lessons Maybe from this by-election. Uh, and one of the right? lessons okay. is that we need to communicate. All right, uh, the votes may be cast, but the arguments are going on. David, back to you in London. Thank you, John. The uh, view is that in about 25 minutes' time, we'll have the result from Wirral South. Though the morning papers have already made up their mind. The sun, inimitably, majors kicked in the Wirrells, elegant as ever, and uh, the Mail says, and it's supported by the Telegraph and the Times, Beaton Major aims to fight on till May, Major will fight on to May the 1st, according to the Daily Telegraph, and to the Times, Ulster deal to protect Major until May the 1st. Stephen Dorrell, do you think May the 1st is the date the Prime Minister will stick with? The Prime Minister's made it abundantly clear for months and months. Uh, that he wanted to see this parliament run its natural term and uh, he's never made any secret about that well, there's been no deal to deliver that that's been his objective stated for months it's because he's stated it so often that nobody believes it well uh, they so think with, he has some trick up his the head. editor of the times and the telegraph clearly believe it they've made it their front page lead all right well now what about this uh, possibility of a vote of confidence after tonight uh, we're joined by margaret ewing of the scottish national party um, Margaret Ewing, you're putting down a motion of no confidence, is that correct? Yes, indeed. We tabled one um, yesterday, I suppose it is now. It's yesterday um, now, in, yes. in the House of Commons. And it's really a challenge to all the parties who've been saying what we need is a general election. And um, I think there are opportunities for us um, to look very quickly at, at the prospect of having that early general election because I think the country and I think everyone is has the feeling that we're in a very phony war situation. We know it's going to be by May the 1st, so um, why hang on for an extra few weeks and um, let the people have their say? Well, Labour came a cropper when they tried this a week or so ago. Uh, are you going to come a cropper over it too? I don't think so, because um, we're very willing to enter into dialogue. I think what happened on the particular Monday, which related to the BSE crisis, uh, was that Labour Party unfortunately didn't talk to all the other parties in the House of Commons and we are certainly very happy to um, discuss with all of the, the other opposition parties um, the issues where we could um, cooperate. Well, what would you say to John Prescott, who's sitting here in the studio, then? Well, I would say to John, I mean, I just listened to Ian McCartney saying on the programme that what we need is a general election. 
um, everybody else that, uh, from the Labour Party seems to say that what we need is a general election. And I would hope that John would um, see the possibility of cooperation with all the parties on the opposition side uh, in the House of Commons to, to pull together and bring about that election which we all want. Will you be supporting a vote of no confidence? We'd like to get rid of the uh, government tonight, tomorrow, whenever it might be, but we've always said that we'd wait to see what the other political parties were doing. On beef, of course, what we put down was a motion that Northern Ireland and every other political party agreed with. But as we saw in that debate, the Ulster Unionist MPs are quite prepared to negotiate and play party off against party. Now, what I find unusual, what Mark is doing there, to, to be frank, is she's announcing her motion after the Northern Ireland Unionists have actually said that they've done a deal with the government. They're going to take this Northern Ireland... Uh, committee and they'll keep them in until May the 1st. Now it does seem silly to put a motion down if you know the Northern Ireland people are saying quite clearly they're not going to do it. And after all, I, I can't help but say to Margaret that uh, it was the Scottish Nationalists that put the Labour government out last time and put these people in. Seems, <laughs> si seems silly, Margaret Ewing, is no, Mr Prescott's well, reaction. Well, jo John may want to say that, um, but uh, we're, we're unafraid of a, a general election. And I think... You uh, think to John, go back to you the think John Prescott's of, um, afraid of a general election? In the light um, of this result from the Wirral? Well, they should be afraid of it. Um, uh, they, they say they've got their programme and they want to put it before the people. But I, I, if I can take John back to what happened on the question of the, the BSE crisis and the motion which was put down by the Labour Party, there was no discussion, no negotiation whatsoever with was, any of the other parties. It was in line with all, all the other parties agreed with. The Northern Ireland made the complaint about the government. They agreed with our position and the criticism of the government. So did yourselves. So did the Liberals. There could be arguments about whether yes, you did. But, but we didn't put anything down that was contrary to a policy of every one of the other opposition but, parties. But, but, but there Your were no motions against John. what the Northern Ireland people have already made clear. They've done the deal with government and that's what they're basically interested in. They've done the deal and they're going to keep the mental the made of so I take it you're not going to support the SNP vote of no confidence? We, we will actually take any chance to beat them, but we don't think this motion will do it in view of the Northern Ireland statement okay. that they're not going to vote or put this government down because right. they've done their the, deal. The interesting thing about this discussion is that John Prescott in particular seems so keen to foreshorten the election campaign to deny the people the opportunity to examine the issues that actually have to be decided at the general election. What, we have, what uh, we, I think we should have is a proper discussion, time in order to assess the choice that the people are going to make. You in mean the, the longer election. between but now and the election, the better? No. What I'm doing, got I mean, made it first made unless you change in the law again. We've made it clear we're running the full term. What they want to do is to cut it short because they're afraid that the lead is 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 <laughs> wilting away. All right. Well, Margaret Ewing, thank you very much for thank you very much, Margaret Ewing, for joining us. Okay, and you, thank you. Sounds as though your your uh, vote of no confidence is going not to have much success with uh, Labour supporting. What about the Liberal Democrats? Well, they support it. Five. It shouldn't have uh, any, any success because it's simply posturing. If the Ulster Unionists have made it clear that they're not willing to bring the government down, there's absolutely no point opposition parties running so-called votes of confidence and allowing the government to win. That has the exactly opposite effect. The headlines on these newspapers you've just produced will say major triumphs. He wins vote, uh, wins vote of confidence in the House of Commons. I'm afraid it's just the SNP trying to pretend that they're in the major league when they're not. I have yes. to say, though, the notion that the longer this goes on, the better it will be, I find that rather surprising because the Wirral by-election campaign has been conducted by the full cabinet arguing precisely the kind of ideas that they would no doubt want to argue in a general election. If what we've just heard is proved to be true, those ideas have been resoundingly rejected. OK, just one other point. Robin Oakley, do you think that May the 1st is now pretty well certain to be the date? Or do you think John Major may want to spring a surprise? Any Prime Minister will want to keep some small element of surprise if he possibly can. We've just started to get the first little filtering of suggestions that uh, there could be another April date. People have talked about April the 10th, that's apparently been rejected. Now there's a little bit of talk about April the 17th as a possibility. I still think it will be May the 1st. I think for a long time it's been fixed in the Prime Minister's mind as May the 1st. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that's what we're going to get to at the end of the day. And when May the 1st comes, Peter Snow, what are the auguries? Well. We've heard about Wirral South, looks pretty grim for the government. What about the national position? And uh, what about Stephen Dorrell's suggestion that Labour's lead is wilting away, or may soon be wilting away? It doesn't look too good for the Conservatives. Here's the latest Mori poll in yesterday's Times. Uh, a 16%, uh, oh, actually a 52-31, a 21% uh, lead for Labour over the Tories. A socking great lead. Uh, here we are very shortly before general election. It's far too big a lead uh, for the government to be... 
uh, feeling it's got any chance of success in the general election on historical precedent anyway. 11% for the Liberal Democrats, a rather low showing for them. Uh, there's the latest showing in the polls, the latest poll of all. And here is the record of the last three years. There is a 12% lead for Labour back in January 94, and that has opened up since then to an absolutely uh, steady 20% or more lead for the Labour Party over the Tories by any measure you like to make it. It's a very, very unprecedented and uh, disturbing position for any government uh, in recent history to see a lead like that. Now, these are the monthly averages in the polls. Some of them are adjusted figures, some of them are unadjusted figures. There is a situation then at the moment of 18% lead uh, for the uh, Labour Party over the Conservatives. Now, also that is echoed by the projected national share in local by-elections. 40 or so local by-elections in the last couple of months projecting something like a 17% lead for Labour, rather matching than 18% in the opinion polls. Here are real people voting in local by-elections projecting something like a 17% lead. Notice the Liberal Democrats doing rather better in these local elections at 20% there. Now, that is a very disturbing picture for a government looking at the swingometer uh, as the weeks ticked by before the general election. Here are the vulnerable blue conservative seats here. Here are the percentage points of swing to Labour along there. And of course, for each percentage uh, movement of the pendulum across, so these blue seats go down. Now, only 14 seats need go down, 14 seats for this pendulum to move just 1% across here and mean that with those 14 seats going from blue to red, the Conservative majority, as we estimate 27 uh, at the last election on the new boundaries, is wiped out. So that will be the end of Mr Major's majority, which will swing of just 1%. A swing of 4.5% would see something like 55 of these blue seats turning red, and the Labour majority of one in the new Parliament. Now, if Mr Blair can win the by-election in Wirral South, and here is Wirral South just here, that would be something like an 8.5% swing, and that would indicate, if it was reflected in the general election, a huge Labour majority of something near 100. But if the polls are right, and the message of the local by-elections is right, and that is reflected in the general election, then the swing moves right on up here, with something like 100 or so of these figures turning from blue to red, a 14% swing would see a Labour majority of something like a couple of hundred. And then you'd have people like the Education Secretary in her seat in Norfolk South West, with a huge, socking red 17,000 majority, looking as if she even might lose her seat in the general election. But of course, there'll be a swing back. It has to be said that the biggest swing back from this position in the polls since the war, even if you think the polls are way out, nevertheless, the biggest swing back has only been 5%. 5% uh, from the poll position two months before an election to the general election figure. So Labour with a thumping great lead, looking very solid right now. David. Thanks, Peter. Well, now, Tony King, if you were John Major watching that, would you um, hang up your boots? I'd be rather depressed. Uh, Robin Oakley spoke a moment ago about the Conservatives having to rethink their strategy. There's a real problem about that. The government, people at Conservative Central Office, have been thinking about a new Tory strategy for months now. And the fact is they haven't been able to come up with one. The one thing that I think John Major ought seriously to consider under these circumstances is accepting Tony Blair's outstanding invitation to debate. The fact is that John Major is a very tough man. He's extremely well informed. He's been doing that job for six years. Uh, the Conservatives are way behind in the polls. Under those circumstances, I would have thought any Prime Minister ought to give serious consideration to accepting uh, that invitation. What, and, and, uh, and showing that he's in command in a way that the other party leaders aren't, because he's... In, in, in the hope that, in a head-to-head -head confrontation with Tony Blair, he could give the country the impression that he, John Major, knows what he's about, in a way that Tony Blair really doesn't, Tony Blair not having done the job. David Hunt said a moment ago that in this campaign all three party leaders, interestingly, are going to be saying the same thing, but only John Major will believe it. And that suggests, that supports your idea, really, that if the policies are very similar, it'll come down to the personalities. One uh, problem for the Conservative Party, which we haven't mentioned, is one of a real credibility gap. 
I was talking to a number of Conservative MPs the other evening and rather startled them by saying that if the government announced that the sun were to come out of the east tomorrow morning, an awful lot of people would look to the west to see the sun rise unusually. If you give voters the uh, series of statements which are true about the way in which the economy is developing and you associate the statements with the Conservative Party, the government is disbelieved. I think the, the damage done to the Tory party and the government on Black Wednesday way back in September 1992 was very serious damage indeed. John Prescott, do you agree that uh, all parties are going to be saying the same thing? David Hunt's point of the campaign? No, I don't. And indeed, uh, we used the card before. I mean, if there are areas which the government bitterly dispute with us, is the fact of the windfall tax for jobs, the fact that we'd reduce the class sizes, the fact that we'd end the internal market in the health system. If you take those actual pledges that we've given and fought this election on, it's been a positive campaign on promises, and it's contrasted vividly with the rather negative campaigning with the Tories, which is based on fear. You know, if you're going to do this, it's a fear of another five years. All these kind of arguments, if the uh, Labour Party was to come in. And I think, no, there are fundamental differences. There are ones that we will emphasise. And one of the great differences is the quality of the leadership, comparing Mr Major and Mr Blair, and a party that's bitterly divided. When you say, look up in the east and they look to the west, this is a party that's bitterly divided every day that doesn't go. Mr. Tebbit on Mr. Heseltine, Mr. Heath rejecting all the arguments about Last devolution. Last right. Brown and Robin Cook, and we hear about your... All the we, the I'll interrupt you a moment because we have the beginnings of signs of action up at the count with um, large numbers of men in suits gathering around discussing, perhaps discussing the result, either the agents or the candidates themselves. And... Um, if that is indeed what's going on, we may be closer to a result than we thought. I said half past one, it's 20 past one at the moment. Uh, Peter Kellner is there. Peter. David, what's happening is that they, they're being shown the, uh, the, the figures to see whether they agree with them. Um, from my looking at the boxes, it looks as if the, the, the current tally is just under 23,000 for Labour, just under 15,000 for the Conservatives, an 8,000 majority going back to Peter Snow's graphic. That's a 17% swing, even greater than in the uh, nationwide opinion polls. Incidentally, uh, what people are saying here is that uh, since this is the last by-election as Parliament, the Conservatives have clearly lost it, this is likely to be the first Parliament since the Great Reform Act of 1832, when the governing party has not won a single by-election. Okay, um, let's come back here for a moment while we wait for that result to come through. Uh, do you want to comment on what John Prescott just said, and uh, do you think John Major should debate? with Tony Blair if, as Tony King says, it's the one last throw that he could uh, Well, I don't think it's one last things. throw, not at all. I think there's a huge, there's, there's still several weeks to go to the election and the, uh, we shall be uh, finding a number of ways, to, uh, there are a, a number of ways open to us to ensure that the real issues are debated. I think if John Major did debate with Tony Blair, then people would see very clearly the advantage uh, the, that John Major has uh, in that comparison, but the question whether he does or not is a matter for him, and uh, I don't think he'd really appreciate public advice from me on this. But you'd like to see him do it, nevertheless, without I'm absolutely giving him certain advice, that of if, course. Just I'm absolutely certain that if he did it, then the the uh, the strength of the prime minister and the and the in the comparison with, frankly, a rather superficial. Uh, opposition leader would be very clear for all. To well, see. it doesn't come across in the parliamentary question times. Just like the papers when they mark them up each day, the Independent. I'm afraid Major's losing out every time. Uh, when Major comes up against Blair, the overwhelming impression of all observers is that Major is the man with the facts and the knowledge and the discipline, and Blair has the soundbite. Well, you, it, didn't sound, it didn't sound like that yesterday, if I may say so, at Prime Minister's questions. Yes. And it seemed to me the Prime Minister was struggling very hard to explain the conduct of the armed forces minister, Nicholas well, Stone. Prime minister. Let me finish for me in, in relation to organophosphates. I don't think you can claim that Major wins every time out. I think it's probably about 50-50. But I think the idea that all three major party leaders, main party leaders, should debate with each other is an extremely sound one indeed. That will give people a proper opportunity to judge the quality of the men who want to right. lead the country. You ought to have a, you ought to have a look at this, um, Stephen Dorrell, which is the, the recovery that you have to stage if you're to win, Peter. I, it, it really is a, a quite a formidable prospect for the Conservatives because there's the, there's the lag the Labour Party had at the last election. 8% behind the Conservatives then. Look at them now. 18% ahead in the opinion polls. In the latest local by-elections, 17% by any measure. 
a huge Labour lead, and that puts Mr Major in a hole uh, rather more dramatic than any of his predecessors. Now here with two months to go uh, is the kind of position that various Prime Ministers had two months before a general election. There's Harold Wilson, Prime Minister of April 1970, two months before the June 70 election, 4% behind the Conservative opposition. He went on to lose the general election, even though he was only 4% behind at that stage. August 1964, Alec Douglas Hume, 7% behind the Labour Party. Uh, Labour went on to win the October general election. There's Ted Heath, minus 7%, December 73. He was in quite a hole then, and he went on to lose the subsequent general election. He was 7% behind Labour then. Wasn't good enough, he lost. Here's Jim Callaghan in March 1979, 15% behind the Conservatives. He went on to lose pretty badly the 79 general election. Well, they all went on to lose. How's Mr Major Place compared to them? Much worse, 18% behind Labour now in February 1997, a couple of months at the most. Uh, there he's got to make up a huge lag behind. He is indeed in a pretty awful hole compared to his predecessors. Now, can he recover? Well, let's just have a look at what's happened. Let's have a look at the best recoveries we've seen in recent political history. Now, here's Ted Heath in December 1973 on a poll rating, party support given to the Conservatives then, in December 1973, two months before the February 74 general election of 36%. Now, he did indeed move up. He didn't win the election, but he did move up. He advanced the Conservatives' share of support, when you look at the real result of the general election, by 3%. So up 3% the Tories then. They made a bit of a recovery. Uh, Mrs Thatcher, too, in April 83, was on 40% uh, support. She managed to push the Conservatives up in, by the time of the June 83 election by 4%. A bit of a recovery there by the Tories in government. Mr Major, in February 92, on 39% share of support in the polls, ended up... Uh, winning the general election, and there he was with 4% uh, advance in that chair. There he is today on 32%. What does he need to win the general election? Something like at least 43%. Now that would mean an advance in conservative support of some 11%. Can he do it? Well, if he does, he'll have created quite a record. It's the best that ever achieved in the past, and that last few months have been 4%. He's going to have a dickens of a time doing that. This is um, condemned by precedent. The yeah. president doesn't look too good, whichever way you look at it. Okay, look, in a moment we'll come and talk about that, but let's just go back up to the uh, Wirral South because we'll see how things are going up there. I think the count is progressing quite well. John Sopel is there. John? David, I think the count has actually progressed. I think what's happened is that I think they are now possibly just verifying any spoilt ballot papers the party agents getting together. What, what's the main thing that's happening is they're trying to clear the desks out of the way so that all the party supporters can get in and uh, start to cheer when the, at the appropriate moment. So I, I would guess, you could always be wrong on these occasions, but I would guess we're sort of five or ten minutes away uh, from a declaration. Before we get to that point, let me bring in Chris Davis, uh, the Liberal Democrat MP for Littleborough and Saddleworth. Um, a few years ago, we'd have been talking about Liberal Democrat bandwagons rolling and cruising to sensational victories, and it looks like it's not going to be much of a squeak from you this evening. We wouldn't be talking about anything of the sort in a seat where we started off in third place and where we have hardly any local government base. The fact is that we think we've got about 10% of the votes tonight, and given that most commentators assumed we were going to lose our deposit, that's a result we're quite happy with. Um, uh, you, you, I seem to remember a certain vote in Crosby not very far from here a few years back. Well, cross one by election, perhaps, <laughs> must be taken each turn. But you just remember, look at the record of by elections through the course of this parliament. We are the by election kings. Four Liberal Democrat gains from the Conservatives tonight, three Labour gains from the Conservatives. And that's, not a, that's not a bad record. And the fact is. And when the Conservatives turn around to you and say, you may well be the by election kings, but all that matters is a general election. And look what happened at the last general election. They won back all the King Cardinal D sides yes. and all those other seats. And look at you won. And look at the David Steeles and the Alan Beats and the Simon Hughes and all the by election winners who are still there. And remember the 158 seats in this country where the Liberal Democrats are in second place, where we're running the town halls, have a good place locally. And we are in best place in those seats to take those seats from the Conservatives. But isn't there a more serious point? That there was a time when people were disillusioned and fed up, that they wanted the middle way, and they turned to the Liberal Democrats in times of by-elections. They haven't turned to you. Your percentage share of the vote is, in all likelihood, we're going to hear in a few minutes, but it's probably going to be down on what it was at the general election. It's going to be about 10%, which, as I say, is about twice what all the political committees, no doubt yourself, and every one of the journalists expected. And I think that's very impressive. And remember, although it's a fact that third parties tend to get squeezed in local elections, 
We are the only party throughout this campaign who has been spelling out what needs to be done in this country, how much it will cost to do it, and how we will afford to pay for those policies. I believe that honesty has helped. Otherwise, frankly, I think we'd have been squeezed out of sight. There would have been a real risk that uh, the Liberal Democrat vote would have gone down. We haven't. We've held up very well indeed. Okay, thank you very much, Chris Davis. Uh, David. John, behind you, the candidates are coming up onto the platform, so let's go over there because I think we're about to get the result of Wirral South. Twelve candidates to go through here, and um, they're gathering round the podium there. The returning officer, who's the High Sheriff, will be giving this result once they're all there. <laughs> Les Barham, the Conservative, in the centre of the picture. Ben Chapman, right beside the podium there, on the immediate right of the returning officer. And Flo Klukas, the Liberal Democrats, in the red blazer. And then other candidates from the, the Linamite Action Group, from the Socialist Labour, from Natural Law Party, UK Independence Party. Stop the Conservatives poncing on tobacco companies party. So we have quite a number to go through. Now just a reminder that at the general election, the Tory majority here was 8,183 on a turnout of 82%. We've had a turnout of 73% in this by-election and the prediction is that um, the Conservatives have suffered a, a wipeout but let's get the figures. I'm not quite sure what they're waiting for. Uh, David, I don't know whether you can hear me. I tell you the reason for the hiatus is that, they, they, that having assembled all the uh, candidates on the stage, they've then had to assemble all the press who've been barred from this rather small room. And so suddenly all the camera crews and the photographers and the reporters have come rushing in. And I think the returning officer is waiting uh, for all of them uh, to get their sort of lenses in position and sort it out before uh, the declaration is made. And I think she's just waiting for the go-ahead uh, from all... And there's great protest here because it's a rather small room and none of, the, none of the photographers can get a vantage point where they can see what's happening. And so there are some very disgruntled uh, camera operators uh, down there and photographers. And there's tripods being shoved around and people getting rather cross but they haven't got a decent position. Well, John Prescott, uh, what are your feelings as you watch this and wait for the uh, result to come through? Give me a great result. Coming at a very good time, but you know, as we always say, we can't be complacent. You go on to the general election, but it's going to be good to get a very good result. And um, I think it's showing the enthusiasm for change. That's clearly what's going to show tonight. And do you think the. Uh... This is the result oh, of the, the result. parliamentary by election for the Wirral South constituency. I, Jennifer Grundy, being the returning officer for the constituency above mentioned, Hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. Samuel St. Anthony, 124. <laughs> Frederick George Astbury, 40. Hooray! <laughs> Harold David Bentz, 184. Leslie Thomas Byram, 14,879. James Keith Chapman, 22,767. Flo Klukas, 4,357. Michael Cullen, Socialist 156. <laughs> Philip Arthur Gott, 148. Disillusioned Conservatives. Geoffrey Stuart Mead. Natural Law Party. 52. Richard Anthony Edward North. UK Independence Party. 410. <laughs> Colin 
Richard Palmer, 44. 21st <laughs> century Roger independent Standring foresters. Taylor, independent. 132. And that James Keith Chapman has been duly elected to serve as member for the Wirral South constituency. So there are the figures. Uh, ben Chapman takes the seat. And his majority, I can't read the screen, unfortunately, 7,858. And let's just see the chair and the change. 17% swing there from Labour um, to Labour from the Conservatives. There's the share, 53 for Labour, 34 for the Conservatives, 10 for the Liberal Democrats. And here's the change since the 92 election, 18% up for Labour, 16 cons Conservatives down, Liberal Democrats down three. And let's hear the speech of the victor, Ben Chapman. May I also thank the returning officer, all his staff, and of course the police, who have ensured that this election and the count tonight has been carried out with the utmost efficiency and speed. Thank you all. I'd also like to thank the other candidates for all the courtesies that they've extended to me during the campaign. I'm most grateful to you. I've been back throughout this campaign by a team of team of people who've worked tires tirelessly on my behalf to ensure this victory tonight. I'm very grateful to them all, but my heartfelt thanks in particular go to my agent. That said, there have been thousands of staff and volunteers who've turned out to support me. Thank you all. The people of Wirral South have spoken for Britain. They saying to John Major and to his government, enough is enough. The Tories have been in power too long. They've lost our trust, our taxes have gone up, they've gone up 22 times, and this in spite of John Major's promise to cut them back year on year. Crime has doubled, the health service is in crisis, and people are working harder, harder just to stand still. No wonder no one trusts the Tories. You can't trust them with our schools. You <laughs> You can't trust them with our health service, and you can't trust them not to put VAT in f on food. They have betrayed us in the past, and we cannot trust them with our future. The Tories have become the party of the few, no longer the party of one nation. Labour now occupies the centre ground. Only Labour offers new hope to this country. The way the parties fought this by-election could not have made this more clear. The Tories spent the campaign attacking Labour and lying about Labour policies. At no time, at no time did they offer a single positive message to the people of Wirral South. We did. Every day, every day, we talked about cutting class sizes about cutting hospital waiting lists, about putting young people back to work, about faster punishment for juvenile crime, and about economic management and doing it competently. We contrasted the strength of the leadership of Tony Blair with the weakness of that of John Major. These were the positive issues on which we proudly and honestly fought in Wirral South. The voters did not just vote against a discredited Tory government, they voted for New Labour. Yeah. They voted for the realistic plans for the Wirral and for Britain. The plans that we put forward every day of the campaign. Time is running out for John Major. He can't run away from an election for very much longer. He knows that the country has given up on him and on his government. He knows the people are turning more and more, as this election has demonstrated, to new Labour. We've had enough of the tired, negative Tory tactics 
and the country deserves something better. From tonight, the general election campaign really begins. The message, the message, my message, is loud and clear. The people have said they want Tony Blair as their Prime Minister and a, a new Labour government that they can trust. The sooner John Major calls the election and gives us all a chance to make the change, the better it will be for all of us. Tonight, tonight is not just a celebration of this historic victory for new Labour in Wirral South. It is the beginning of the campaign to ensure that I remain Labour MP for Wirral South after the general election. I thank you. Now that was Ben Chapman, Labour victor, self-effacing in victory as he was in the campaign. And he'll be followed by the Conservative, defeated. Conservative, Les Barham. I can't, I can't hear. Yes. And he's just obeying the instructions of the photographers. <laughs> Enjoy the moment. Ben Chapman with his with his daughter beside him. Well, we'll 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 wait watching this rather. Curious um, photo call for the victor because we want to hear what the Conservative has to say. Thank you. Thank you. So here he is, Les Barham. Um, Madam High Sheriff, the returning officer of the candidate, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for what has been a good campaign kept on the issues. I'd like to thank the returning officer and all of his staff for a good night and bringing the result in very quickly. And very hot in here as well. I'd also like to thank the police for a very good day without any difficulty whatsoever. I'd like to thank my election agent, Wendy Powell, and all the other helpers who came from around the country to help with our campaign. But I'd also like to thank the legacy that Barry Porter had left to us here, which he started before he left us, which has put us in a very good position. I'd also like to thank Janice, my wife, and our children. I am home. I am home. We're all south is a very special place. And I intend to be back in the general election, which will be in only a few weeks' time. My future is here in Wirral South, and I believe that Britain's future is with John Major, and he will win the general election, as I will win here at the general election. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, a rather briefer speech from the defeated Conservative. His uh, majority, the Conservative majority of 8,000, turned into a Labour majority of 7,800. And uh, as the Liberal Democrat starts to speak, John Prescott, what's your reaction to what your candidate had to say there? <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations to Ben, Ian McCartney, and David Evans as a great team. They've the worked very quiet, hard. The new quiet face of Labour. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they've every reason to feel great about that result. It's good organisation as well as putting the ideas forward. And I think it'll be quite an historic victory, actually. It is a very good victory for the Labour Party. And it has shown that the people in Whittle are changing quite rapidly over to another party. We have become the majority party. We've now got the majority that size that they had at the last by-election. They've been pushed down to, what, about 30%. We're well over 50-odd percent. Now, that's a very good victory for us. And I think it signals considerable change and a good omen for the general election that can't be far away. Peter Snow, let's have a reminder, then, of uh, the result. One of the biggest messages any government must have had from the last minute by-election. Here is the result. Uh, and uh, there's the Wirral. There's the red slash across there, across the Wirral Peninsula. Uh, and this is, don't forget, normally a comfortable Conservative seat. Now the 22,000-odd Labour uh, figure there with miles ahead of the Conservatives on 14,000. The Liberal Democrats down on 4,300-odd. A group of others with 1,290 between them. Now what's happened here is that a 
Tory majority, just over 8,000, has been turned into a Labour majority of something like the same. So there's a comfortable Conservative seat now looking very comfortable for Labour, only two months before a general election. And here is the share in Wirral South, 53%, 34%, the Conservatives, 10% uh, the Liberal Democrats, and the others on 3%. Now the change that represents on the general election in Wirral South uh, five years ago, 18% rise for Labour, and a 16% drop for the Conservatives, that is a swing of 17%, a massive swing in a by-election like this, so close to a general election. We're used to swings of sort of 5, 6, 4, 3%, but this is a huge swing uh, against the government. Uh, if it's going to win the general election, it's a very, very big swing indeed. Minus 3% the Liberal Democrats and 1% the others. Looking back then at the recent uh, performance of the Tory government, there's the election of 92 here, the changes in various... Uh, events since then, the Staffordshire South East by election, just a year ago, a 22% drop there. That was a very bad result for the Tories, but that was some way before a likely general election. In the local elections last year, they were down 16%. Uh, in the Barnsley East by election in December, they were minus 7%. Uh, in the local by elections, they're down 14% uh, on their general election figure, the, the projection from the local by elections. The opinion polls suggest that they're 11% down on their general election showing, and here now we have a drop on their general election showing of 16% in this Wirral South by-election. So by any count, this is a very poor result for a government looking ahead to a general election. And another point, of course, that this uh, by-election brings is the moment when the uh, dead heat in the House of Commons that we've had for the last uh, few weeks uh, has now become, uh, with this result, 322, 322, the opposition, in there goes the successful victor, the Labour victor in the Wirral South by election to join the Labour benches, and that puts the opposition up to 323. An opposition majority now in terms of voting, if they can all vote together, of one vote against the Conservative government. David. Peter, thanks so much. Uh, Stephen Doyle, this is going to start a leadership battle going again in the Tory party, isn't it? No, absolutely not. What uh, Les Byram, I think, fought a very good campaign. I congratulate Ben Chapman on his victory. But what Les Byram said in his speech there has history on its side. The fact is that in the last uh, parliament, uh, we lost a number of by-elections. We regained every one of those seats. But not on the following, this, not the on following the scale. General, uh, following general election. Actually, several by-elections we lost both in the last parliament and in this one with significantly greater swings than this. Uh, they were, the all, they were all won back at the general election. Well, we're joined now by Ben Chapman, the victor. <laughs> Mr. Chapman, thank you for joining us. Congratulations on the result. Can you, can, you, can you hear us here I'm, in the studio? I'm, I'm getting you moderately well, yes. Moderately well, good. Um, why were you so... Well, you, you, you weren't really there during the campaign. Everybody's been saying they could never find you. And now you suddenly emerge as the victor. What, what, what was going on? Well, I think uh, it wasn't uh, me who couldn't be found. Uh, I was around all the time talking to the people. I talked to 15,000 people on the streets of the world and uh, was always available to, to the media at any time. And, and you see this as a, as a permanent change in the nature of that constituency and uh, a, a, a Labour Party that uh, you feel completely happy with because it's quite unlike the Labour Party John Prescott used to be in before it started to change. I think uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, with New Labour, of course, and I'm also very happy with the permanence of the change in this constituency. People have indicated that uh, they're fed up with the Tories, they're fed up with their record on education, health, employment, law and order and tax. They're switching to new Labour. You, um, for a few weeks at any rate, will be in the House of Commons and uh, the deputy leader of your party is here. I just perhaps he'd like to say a word to you. Yes, well, congratulations, Ben. You did marvellous there. It is an historic and a magnificent victory for Labour. But tell them down there they've still got to keep working with the general election. Don't be complacent. You've given us a good victory, but now let's get on. And it's a good victory for Tony Blair. He's the new force for change here, and that's what's come out of the world. I'm not, uh, I'm not hearing you too well, John, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we when certainly... the election did? Well, we the, kind of thing, the kind of thing he was saying was congratulations, and um, <laughs> this is a great victory for Tony Blair, and that sort of thing. Well, well indeed, indeed. But as, as, as I think you were saying, uh, we, we, we don't take anything for granted. We must work hard for the general election, and the campaign starts, as far as we're concerned, right now. What do, you, what, what do you say to the uh, argument that this has been won, really, by Labour adopting Tory policies and that just people are fed up after 18 years of the Tory party and want to change? Well, Labour's, Labour's been adopting uh, Labour policies, the policies that we've been uh, expressing for some time now, the, profit, the policies of reducing waiting lists in hospitals, 
the policies of reducing class sizes, the policies of fast-tracking youth, young criminals into court, the policies that we've uh, developed in our pledges. Mr Chapman, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Well, what's your reaction to this, Tony King? Have you seen Peter Snow's figures of the um, improvement the Tories have got to make if they're to get anywhere, and it looks pretty devastating. Well, at the risk of sounding like John Prescott, I have to say this is an absolutely stunning Labour victory. Uh, in all the by-elections that have been held since the Second World War, there have been only eight in which there has been a swing against the Conservatives to Labour of more than 15%, and six of them have occurred in this Parliament. And to have a, a, a Labour victory on that kind of scale, only nine weeks to the day before Stephen Doral assures us there's going to be a general election is, is quite staggering. And certainly there is no, pre I was about to say there's no precedent for a recovery from that position, but no uh, government has ever been in that position before so close to a general election. It, it is an, an amazing victory for the Labour Party. What will the effect, Robin Oakley, be on Tory morale? It will certainly see Tory morale sink. I would think there would be a real chill sinking into the bone marrow of Tory MPs now because the Tories have been waiting for so long for the turning point in this Parliament. Round after round of Euro elections, local elections, parliamentary by-elections, time after time they are saying, well, surely we're going to bottom out here and start the recovery. And now there's, there's such a pattern of solidity about the opinion polls, about local government by-elections, about what's happened here in the world by-election. They must be beginning to fear what if the polls aren't, as they've been telling themselves, what if the polls aren't overstating the Labour lead? What if this really is the national picture and nothing is going to change it? What if there really is no recovery between now and a general election? That thought is bound to go through the minds of Tory MPs. There are, there are 130 Tory MPs sitting in, in seats uh, which are easier for Labour to win than the Wirral would be at a general election. Uh, this is a very worrying moment for them, just nine weeks away at maximum from a general election. In 1992, John Major seemed to be about the only person who believed he could win in his party, and he proved he was right. Do you think he'll go on believing he can win? He clearly does still believe that. A, a, a lot of people in the Tory party still say, well, he is the one man who really does believe and doesn't say in private or in public uh, that he has any doubts about that victory. He's, he's proven himself as an effective election campaigner, and it's interesting that he is still polling well ahead of his party. I think Tony King is probably right in saying maybe John Major ought to go for that TV debate uh, with Tony Blair and hope that in some way he can start to turn things round for his party in an election campaign. But I understand that while the Tory party has been having serious studies about the prospect of that, Mr Major himself is adamant that he won't do it with Paddy Ashdown as well as Tony Blair. Which he may legally have to if he's to do it at all. Indeed. Les Barham joins us now, the Conservative candidate in the Wirral South who was defeated. Mr Barham, uh, thank you for joining us. Now, how are you going to turn this thing round, as you so confidently said you would in the general election? Because all our experts here are saying this is an absolutely devastating result for the Conservatives. Well, we'll turn it round by hard work, as always, and the usual sort of campaigning things that the Conservative Party are very, very good at. I mean, this is a by-election, and uh, whilst I'm personally very, very disappointed, I'm still very confident that I will be the MP for Wirral South We'll take on from Barry Porter, who was a very good friend of mine and was a good constituency MP. He's left me a legacy that I can pick up from at the general election, and then it'll be business as usual. But, uh, Janice and I will be coming to live over on this part of the world, and our association will fight, 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 and we'll win come wherever the general election is. But have you done your figures? Um, I think your own aides and assistants have been pushing me here and pushing me there. I haven't had the chance to analyze the figures. Well, like but a 17% a 17 by election mentality. A 17% a 17 swing against the conservatives which all the experts say is unheard of for anyone to recover from within a matter of weeks. Those are the same experts that were predicted that we would lose in 92 and John Major won, took the country on and on and on and will continue to do that in my opinion after the next general election. Mr. Barham, thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, Peter Snow, where are, are you? There. Good. Let's just have a look at the. Uh, what are you going to show us? Well, I'm going to show you, David. Um, Your battle buses. The, I'm going to remind you. Remember Final Plunge, the picture I showed you some time ago of these buses on there. They're battle buses on their way across this gorge that uh, any government has to cross in a final by-election. They tend to drop rather badly. They tend to have a final plunge. And in this last-minute by-election plunge, you remember we drew a line 
a 10% line between the drop that is just about tolerable for a government facing this last minute by-election, and they manage to pull up, they have the momentum to pull up and go on the victory past the winning post, and below 10%, 13%, 16%, 28% drop in the governing party's vote in that by-election, tends to see them stuck in the mire and not making it uh, up the other slope, the other side. Now, where is Mr. Major? There's the 10% line. Is he going to manage to get less than 10% of a drop or more than 10% of a drop? Well, we all know, of course, what happened in the World South by-election. It was a huge drop. It was more than 10%. There he goes as his battle bus driving towards the winning post here. Look how far he's going down. Into the mire. He's up to the gunnels. He's up to the, even the Conservative slogan there is almost swamped. Minus 16.4%. He's not going to make it up here if history is any guide, but of course history is often wrong and we find the odd things happen in the British electoral system, so that doesn't look too good. Now what about our swingometer? Here's the swingometer. These are the vulnerable Tory MPs here, the blue seats that will turn red for every point of swing to Labour. This is what Tony Blair needs. He needs a swing of 4.5% if he's going to get a Labour majority of just one there. Now. In the polls at the moment and in local by-elections, we have a swing against the uh, Conservatives, a swing to Labour of something like 14%. That's what the polls are suggesting, and they could be, of course, wrong. That's what local by-elections are also suggesting. They, too, could be giving a false indication before a general election. And so, I suppose, perhaps, could the by-election swing, which is showing a staggering 17%. Really very dangerous for a government indeed only two months before a general election. A 17% swing to Labour. Now that, if it were anywhere near repeated as a general election, would see, and all over the country, would see Labour in with a massive majority of something like 300. But of course the Tories will perhaps recover a bit. But don't forget the biggest recovery uh, has been something like only 5% since the war uh, in uh, a government facing that kind of size of swing against it in the polls. Yes, they've got a bit back, but nothing like that 17%. OK, thanks very much, Peter. Um, Min Campbell, from the Liberal Democrats' point of view, what do you make of this result and of uh, Flo Lucas's 10% or so of the poll? Well, it would be churlish not to congratulate John Prescott and the Labour Party, because this is a very good result for them. Uh, we've had four such nights or mornings in the course of this Parliament, and it's right to acknowledge that this has been a very good night or morning for Labour. I rather think that Robin Oakley's right that the uh, shock waves that this is going to send through the Conservative Party are going to be very considerable indeed. And I shall be very surprised indeed if the incipient leadership contest does not actually now break out to the sort of extent we saw immediately before Christmas. I think people in the Tory party will now begin to think, what are we going to do after we lose the election? And from that point of view, I think it's a disaster for the Conservative Party. So far as Flo Klukas is concerned, to get 10% in circumstances where uh, the pressure was very considerable, where the squeeze was very considerable, seems to me a perfectly respectable result. It's not a brilliant result, but it's a perfectly respectable one. Do you agree with that, Tony King? Yes, I think I do. Uh, one of the things that both the Liberal Democrats must want in their heart of hearts, and the Labour Party too, is that Liberal Democrats, on the whole, not very well in conservative Labour marginal seats, uh, but for the Labour Party to do well there and for the Liberal Democrats to do well in their own territory. And the World South is frankly not a serious proposition from the Liberal Democrat point of view. Right. I think, if I may say so, that always when uh, governments lose by elections on programmes like this, people uh, do swingometer calculations, they prepare, they present uh, the implications of the result in terms of the next House of Commons. It's all good stuff on by-election programmes, but it really does bear very little resemblance indeed to the underlying reality of politics. We should remind ourselves, eight days before the last general election, not two months, eight days before the last general election, uh, it was predicted that Labour was going to win by, with a majority by 8% ahead of the Conservatives. We were actually 8% ahead of Labour polling day eight days later. That was a 16% difference. So what we actually have to do is to focus on the arguments. It's great to come on these programmes. Of course we can, uh, can uh, do all these computer graphics and say this means that the, uh, there's going to be a Labour government with uh, hundreds of seats. What we actually need to do is to focus on the arguments and the choice that the British people face within two months from now and the implications of that choice for the country they are going to live in for the next five years. But what's that but, uh, what you were doing in the by-election? 
I mean, it, wasn't that the nature of the campaign it, that the government sought to fight in the by-election, sending the cabinet there, arguing the themes which you will undoubtedly use in the general election? Indeed. And what we now need to be doing is taking the argument not from Wirral South, but presenting it to the country as a whole, challenging John Prescott to say we have a budget that Gordon Brown has this promised is us. One line. He's this come is, out every time. Well, indeed, the because I haven't had an answer yet. I haven't had an answer. You said it, there's a quote from you on the record saying, of course, we're not going to tell the British people what we're going to do in our tax policy. That's what we're going to be. You're going to hear this question day after day between but, now but, and polling day. But because Stephen unless Gore. you tell people what a Labour government would mean, I don't think they will trust you. Stephen Doyle, Peter Smith, perhaps you'll confirm, but it seems to me that, that you say these figures are fun on a by-election night but don't actually mean anything, but in truth they bear out what's been happening in local elections, yes. they bear out what the opinion polls have been yes. showing. Uh, they show a fairly pronounced, substantial, steady move against the government. It is you, can't, you can't sort of treat, the, treat this one as though it was just a... I certainly am not uh, treating it as, uh, a, uh, as something that isn't real, but what I am saying is that it doesn't tell us what is going to happen after a two-month cam election campaign when people will repeatedly hear Labour spokesmen ex challenge to explain what is going to be in this budget, challenge to explain what they mean by Look, their I education policy. Hold on, John, substantial. just let him finish. And then, uh, 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 he's only repeating budget. what he said before. Well, uh, I love to, uh, <laughs> well it's a long campaign <laughs> all, ahead. You're all going to be repeating what You're going to hear it before. many, many <laughs> more times. He just until lost you, one and start <laughs> again. Until I'm you produce an answer. I'm sorry well, for the voters. I mean, what I certainly do think is that between now and the general election, it isn't computer graphics that's going to in, in interest people. It's the real issue. Right, John, John Prescott. Look, of course, I think there's something really substantial happened here that we have to keep our attention on. In all by-elections, they always want to protest people, and I think Stephen's been making this point about protest. I think it's a bit arrogant to assume in a few weeks' time they're going to come back to them. We'll, we'll wait and see. The real point is a lot of people have been definitely switching. There used to be a time when they switched from Labour, perhaps to Liberal, on the way to the Tories. What we've seen is a definite switch in a very positive way now from Tory voters have switched over to Labour in a substantial way. Now that's very significant here in the Whittle. It's very much to do with Tony Blair. It's very much to do as people see new Labour and the changes that have come about. And I think what's come together as well, not only the change, it's time for change, as well as Tony Blair representing that kind of change. And it's certainly persuaded many people who have always voted Tory have now come over to vote Labour. Yeah, that is okay. quite they, significant. They've heard, let's, let's, heard let's, the message, it's time for a change. What we now have to ask them, time for a change from what and to what? To well, what, what, well, what change? Now, will you enter in the argument? Well, I'll on. give you that card for the Thank next very few much. weeks ne we're going to have. Next time we meet on a programme, <laughs> I'll answer them point by point. Well, that'll no. be on and we look, we look forward. The we look forward, Mr Darrell, to seeing what change the Tories are proposing from what to what. No doubt. A good deal of speculation. Well, he's read that. He'll become a switcher himself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I Peter, wondering if that's what's called a switch card. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, let's just have a look, Peter, at the House of Commons, as it well, might be. Indeed, no doubt uh, if this happened on election night. And, and so on. And indeed, it is always on these by-election programs a bit of fun. But perhaps tonight, less, of, less fun than it usually is. Less of a, a, a sort of just an illustrated joke than it usually is. Because... What so often happens if the Liberal Democrats score a great big by-election victory and the whole House of Commons goes gold, nobody really believes that's going to be the position of the subsequent general election. But tonight, because these, this result is a little bit greater, yes indeed, a little bit greater than the polls are suggesting, a little bit greater than local by-elections are suggesting, there will of course be a return to the Conservatives. There usually is a recovery, a historical precedent, to the government. Nevertheless, this is an illustration of what would happen if, and it's not that big an if, if this was what happened in every seat. These changes occurred in every single seat over the country. This is what would happen to the shape of the House of Commons. So we open the door and we have a look first at the opposition benches. And here we have on the opposition benches, if these changes were reflected in every seat in the country, in this by-election, 126 Conservatives under John Major. Beside him, Paddy Ashton would have how many Liberal Democrat MPs? A total of 31, beside him 26 others, the Unionists, the Nationalists and so on. And here we have the winning post. Now any party needs to cross the 330 winning posts if it's to win an overall majority uh, in the House of Commons. 
Now, Tony Blair's Labour Party, would it be through the winning post? No prizes for guessing that, but how far through the winning post would Tony Blair be if this were repeated precisely? And of course, it won't be at the general election, but it may not be that far away if history's any guide. 476 Labour MPs in the House of Commons. And that would put the total on the governing benches, if that were the general election result, 476 against the opposition, 183, a Labour majority of 293. Haven't seen anything like that this century. Uh, and that is what it would be like, David. Peter, thank you very much. I won't Trouble. repeat what John Prescott <laughs> just said. <laughs> what did you say? Trouble. Trouble. <laughs> Go blimey, trouble. John Prescott wouldn't believe it. <laughs> uh, let's just uh, join John Sopel back there up in Wirral South before we go. John, last word to you if you're there. Yes, David, I don't know about time for change. I think the caretaker is looking around saying it's time for everyone to go home. They can't understand why, when the result was declared half an hour ago, that people are still lingering. Uh, there are still a few that are just chewing over the fat of the result, uh, doing their calculations, and uh, the policemen waiting for everyone to go for the reporters to get their last camera shots, their last interviews with the various candidates who are still milling around before people go off to their parties. The only other observation, slight observation I make, Ben Chapman sort of looks very nervous and tentative this evening. Les Byram, who's lost uh, very heavily seems to be beaming so I don't know what one is to make of that but that seems to be the mood here all right thank 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 you very much indeed and uh, Robin Oakley what's your summary of this and the way it leaves things it's a desperate night for the Conservatives deeply worrying time they have to thrash around now and really re-examine their strategy and just a, a note of regret in in passing perhaps for maybe we've seen the end of the old-style by-election, the end of the morning press conferences, very few public meetings, an awful lot of telephone canvassing by people who could have an alternative career as double-glazing salesmen. And uh, I gather in some cases, Labour's very impressive and slick machine. They were even matching posh vo voices uh, among their Labour MPs to the, the, the posher uh, people that they'd found in the constituency. And well, you politics mean if you were in the posh part of Wirral South, you've got a posh yeah, Labour that's right. voice. Indeed, yes. And if you were in, um, if you were in Port Sunlight, you've got a different kind you, you, of voice. Where, where did John Prescott you? That's that's where, you. <laughs> where did you have the love for John that, Prescott? That's where they never let me on the <laughs> telephone. Because <laughs> <laughs> Wirral is ginger. <laughs> OK, Tony King. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me very forcibly is the difference in the feel between 1997 and 1992. You get this from the polls, but you get it just talking to people. Before the 1992 election, there were a lot of people out there who were deeply worried about the prospect of a Labour government. They feared for the country, they feared for themselves if Neil Kinnock won. What strikes me very forcibly in 1997 is that that worry, that fear has largely gone. Even people who will vote Conservative in the end give me the impression that they don't really mind desperately if Labour wins. That's hugely different from five years ago. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony King. Thank you all. Thank you, politicians, for coming here. Uh, thank you, too. And uh, just in case you've only just come in and turned on, the result of the Wirral South by-election, 8,000 Conservative majority overturned, and the majority is 7,888 for Labour, a 17% swing to Labour. The last by-election of this Parliament, and I guess you could say the general election campaign, has now begun. From all of us here, good morning. <laughs>